Hi, I'm Dana Brigman. I'm a wellness educator for dogs and a dog trainer. I'm here to help you get proactive with your dog's health and natural wellness to save you money on vet visits, improve your dog's quality of life, and fully enjoy your well-behaved dog. Over the years, I sought many answers for why dogs were struggling with so many behavioral and health issues. I found some amazing answers in nutrition and natural wellness. My goal today is to leverage every available modality to help us achieve long-term results and a thriving, healthy, happy dog. Nothing brings me more joy than bringing a dog back into balance and giving that joy to his family. I'm Dana Brigman of the Canine Coach Carolinas. I hope you will enjoy this podcast series designed to help you learn more about nutrition, natural wellness, and behavior for your dog. Good morning, everybody. It's Dana, and I have with me Dr. Barb Fox, and I'm going to give her a moment or two to introduce herself and all the amazing things she's working on. And uh, then we're going to get into what I'll call today a Q&A about a number of different topics that I think are relevant to our dog lovers and dog mamas. So, Dr. Barb, please give us a little bit of background about yourself and how people could reach you. Thanks, Dana. It's, I'm happy to be back here. I think this is our third one we've done so far. Oh, we've done more and, than um, that. I, have we? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Barb Fox. I'm a holistic veterinarian in Northeast Iowa. I've been in practice for 27 years. And in 2007, when I had a cancer diagnosis, I chose not to go through the conventional treatment for the cancer and instead turned to holistic methods for getting my body back in shape and, and good health again. And I was so thrilled. I mean, to, to because mm. everybody thinks, so oh, if you don't go through the chemo and radiation, you're going to die. I felt intuitively that I would die had I gone through that. So I did all my research. In fact, I, um, I got into essential oils through the advice of an organic, well, it was a veterinarian, a large animal veterinarian, actually, that was um, using organic, I'm sorry, using essential oils in his organic dairy herds. And um, he said, Barb, if you've got cancer, you've got to be doing essential oils. And I said, wow, Merle, why? What are they? I just thought they were something that smelled good. You know, mm -hmm. I had no idea. And then he gave me the example of like frankincense. And he says, if you look up the properties of frankincense essential oil, which is Boswellia carteri, he said, you will find that this oil can actually kill tumor cells, but it will not kill your regular cells. And he gave me the, the uh, research, I think it's pubmed.gov, um, where you can go get these articles. And I started researching and then um, going to all kinds of classes and workshops. And the more I got into the essential oils and finding out how they work, as well as how important nutrition and, um, you know, a healthy lifestyle was to all disease and health, then I started getting better. Um, I did have the lump removed in my right breast. Um, that was the only surgical or the only conventional intervention. I did not do any chemo or, or radiation but I adopted that lifestyle we're all supposed to think about having as well as the psychological well-being. And uh, I'm still, people say, well, did it work? Uh, I'm still here. So I guess it worked, yeah, exactly. you know, but My goodness, <laughs> right. <clears throat> and the things that I used to have all the health issues like fibromyalgia has severe allergies, um, gastro, oh, that GERD, the gastroesophageal reflux, um, I, I had a host of, of issues. And as I got healthier through the lifestyle program that I had adopted, then things started falling off by the wayside. And I started feeling better than I had in 20 years. And I was 50 when I was diagnosed. I'm 64 now. So, and I'm still kicking. So anyway, when I got healthy and I was so happy and just in awe at the response that my body had, I figured, how could I incorporate this into animals? Mm -hmm. And then I started finding out, well, people are already using essential oils with their animals. They've been doing that for a long time. They, um, you know, uh, all the meetings and classes I went to and finding other holistic veterinarians that were doing all these really cool modalities. And this is how I got started um, using natural products and therapies in my practice. And it's been a godsend. It really has because there are so many animals that I, 
um, have helped get back to, to regain their health. Um, and I'm not saying I did it, please. The, the body heals itself. You give it the tools to heal mm -hmm. it and it'll heal itself. But I was just um, amazed at how my patients were responding to holistic therapies. And uh, that's where I am today. I'm, I do consultations. I will consult with anybody who can provide me medical records and a diagnosis from their veterinarian if they want to take a holistic approach and they can't find that veterinarian um, that will help them with that. And I've written a couple of books. Um, I speak at different conferences across the country. And I'm also a member of the Veterinary Medical Aromatherapy Association. So, um, and, the, and the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association. So anyway, I've got a very busy schedule. I love it. I love what I'm doing. And I'm so glad to be here with you, Dana. Thank you. And tell them your website. Okay. It's barbfoxdvm.com. Awesome. Very simple. Yep. Okay. And she's, she's my go-to referral when we need a telemedicine for <clears throat> clients in my area of the country that don't have access to holistic veterinarians. And sometimes when they need more than what's offered here anyway. So, so Dr. Barbara, let's move into some Q and A and you triggered a question for me um, in your overview. And that's, you know, when we get a diagnosis like cancer or, even diabetes in our animals, for example, it's often hard to accept taking a natural approach versus what is more commonly offered in traditional veterinary medicine. So what would you say to somebody who's trying to evaluate that decision of, can I really forego this traditional protocol and step into this natural space? Well, Dana, it's always been my premise and my ideas, my thoughts based on experience and my professional um, education that if we were taking a natural preventative approach to health, we wouldn't be seeing a lot of the things that we're seeing. And by that, I mean not feeding processed foods to our dogs, not um, putting all the chemicals that we do on our dogs and our other pets, um, providing them a habitat, an environment, or should I say, um, that is what they would naturally be in. You know, like um, people oftentimes think that um, they can keep a large breed dog, a herding dog in a small apartment, and then they're relinquishing that a few years later because that environment is not right for that type of dog. Yep, I have so, that appointment next week. <laughs> exact same appointment. Okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, so, um, you know, like one thing I do want to say, a little disclaimer here, that if you have an emergency situation, if you have a, an extremely critical animal, you cannot take a natural approach at that point. If right. it is a life-threatening event, say like, a dog was just attacked by another dog. It's got 105 fevers, got oozing, weeping sores all over it. Maybe um, it has some internal damage. That dog is need, going to need to go to the emergency clinic, probably get on IVs, get some intravenous antibiotics as well, and stabilize it. And once that dog is stabilized, then you can say, well, let's use some herbs. Let's use some essential oils. Let's use some homeopathy to bring this body back in balance. I think that's super important. But I think that um, as a uh, formerly conventionally trained veterinarian, we rely on the pills and the drugs and the surgery first before we try anything else. And I think that is oftentimes the backwards way of looking at things. Yeah. What would you advise somebody who has had to go to, say, an emergency vet scenario? And if they're anything like me, they're sprinkling oils on them en route. <laughs> But once you get right. there and you're standing before this emergency department veterinarian and things get stable and then you want to say to them, all right, I need, I need to bring out my lotions and my potions and they're going to have that conflict. What would you say to the dog mama as to how to begin or how to have that conversation with a more traditional veterinarian? That's a tough one because in my experience, um, even my colleagues have, I don't even know what the word is, 
diminished what I do, diminished how I think, um, because they are so systemically brainwashed. And by that, I mean that when you're in conventional veterinary practice and you've gone through the schooling, you go to your continuing education meetings and you don't think outside the box, it's really tough. I mean, I was there at one time, honest to God, I was there at one time where I poo-pooed anything that wasn't science. And I say that in quotation marks because science incorporates so many different things. Yeah, we have the research studies, but I'll tell you what, Dana, those research studies can be altered. You, you've heard of ghost writers before. These are people that are hired to write articles and research, scientific research can be changed, blah, blah, blah. I know I'm going down a rabbit trail here, so you might have to bring me back. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where uh, it wasn't until my own health care and my, uh, my willingness to look at a different way of healing that brought me to where I am today. And so people say, oh my God, that must have been horrible having that cancer. And I say, well, it was very scary, but I don't regret it today because I would not be helping the animals and the people that I am. Right. Okay. So how to approach your veterinarian? I guess um, you can't, <laughs> you can't always tell them you must show them. So what I would say is if you have this animal and you're doing these um, non-conventional treatments at home, I take pictures before and after pictures during or before, during and after pictures. And I have several clients that do that. And you can't argue with results. Right. I've even had some veterinarians challenge them saying, oh, you must have been doing something else. You must have been doing some other things besides just holistic. And no, but it at least plants the seed there. Yeah. May not get them on the right track. But um, I think that the other thing I do is that is very important is I teach people, I, I teach empowerment. Because nobody knows your animal. Nobody knows your dog like you do. Right. And it is the wrong thing to be bullied into a treatment or a procedure that you think is wrong. And uh, this goes for vaccines. It goes for chemical flea and tick products. It goes for, through so many things, unnecessary surgeries even. So, mm -hmm. um, and it happens I to kind all of like, us. I, I was just listening yeah, to does. somebody, and I'm not going to name names, but very very knowledgeable in the in the natural wellness space for many many years and basically said okay to a traditional veterinarian <laughs> and it's like why did I do that why did I allow that to happen and now they're in a complicated scenario that they're trying to recover from when all she had to do was say no and she felt uncomfortable in that moment with that veterinarian saying no to him. So I, um, shifting just a little bit slightly, but still in this topic, <clears throat> when we, when we start and we're, we're thinking about getting proactive, we often hear terms like start slow, low and slow with essential oils, ease your way into the introduction. And all of that makes sense. And it's certainly a protocol um, method that I follow when introducing oils or supplement or even a detox type protocol to an animal. When we get that cancer diagnosis, for example, we have to get a lot more aggressive, right? We can't just tiptoe our way into this. So can you speak to helping um, dog parents understand that that you're kind of going to have to be really assertive. If you're going in, you're going to have to go in pretty heavy duty. Do you know what I mean? Do you understand my question? That you're going to have to be pretty aggressive about the healing, but you also have to be right. aware of that it might get worse before it gets better. If we're talking about allergies, for example, they may flare up before they settle down, you know, that kind of thing. I'm glad you brought that allergies um scenario up Dana because what happened I'll, I'll just and I'll tell you what happened with me when I had the cancer diagnosis I was going to a chiropractor that when she looked at my chart um, I didn't first of all let me back up I had the surgery to remove the lump that was it I went back for a three-month checkup I've never been back to a conventional practitioner I rely on my chiropractors my massage therapists and my reflexologists to keep me healthy okay 
But when I went to this chiropractor, and this is right after I healed up from the lump removal, she looked at my chart and she goes, well, Barb, I see you have a temporary health challenge. You want to get started? And I went, wow, temporary health challenge. Nice. The oncology, the, the surgeons, uh, you know, or the ob gin clinic I went to when I first had the lump found, they were um, like, you're, you're, you're not going Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. End of life. And, uh, so yeah. Yeah. correct. Right. And so my chiropractor started me on a bunch of nutritional supplements and then some other therapies that are kind of, um, you know, not, not well known about, but I was so toxic, Dana, that I broke out in this horrible rash all over my body. It looked like I had chicken pox. I itched like crazy. Mm-hmm. And so in my experience, in my situation, I had to back off and go a little more slowly, but being aggressive doesn't mean just the products that you use. It means right. getting an attitude of gratitude. It means changing your psychological outlook. It means eating the way that you're supposed to eat, reducing that sugar and the carbs and um, eating organically as possible getting out and enjoying fresh air and sunshine. And this goes for our animals too. We can't just give them the doom and gloom diagnosis there. So um, I'm not sure if that answered your question, but um, when, well, when we go, Oh, go ahead. No, finish your statement. And then I'll come back and reframe that question just ever so slightly. Okay. So going back to the allergy situation, when I broke out in that horrible rash, I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm allergic to these supplements. And I looked at one, sure enough, there was a Spanish moss, Solanzia. It was in every product. And I'm thinking, I'll bet that was it. Well, (laughs) you know, um, when I started to back off on the amount, just, I was so toxic. It was, and normally when your organs are working correctly, you're going to pee it out or poop it out. Same way with our animals. Everything toxic is supposed to go out the excretory systems, Mm -hmm. which is your kidneys or your colon. So um, anyway, I lost my train of thought. Oh, allergies. Yes. So I kept telling my chiropractor, I'm allergic to this stuff. I'm allergic. She goes, no, you're just peeing you're trying to pee it out, but you're peeing it out for your skin. And it didn't make sense to me. <laughs> right. And, and she goes, Barb, she says, your, your skin is your biggest organ. And if you can't get it out, you're overtaxing your other excretory pathways. It's going to come out your skin. I'm like, bingo, got it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's what happens with our animals. They're toxic from the things that we do to them, the things we put into them. And then we have these, al- what we call allergies when it's actually a detoxification. Yeah. And so I don't separate the two anymore. Um, if somebody says my dog's allergic, I go, I'm thinking in my mind because they may not be on the same thought process yet that I am, but I'll say, yeah, they're too toxic and this is what's happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had a little dog, little tiny dog that was, I mean, almost hairless it was the skin was so bad food was terrible and so we started transitioning to a raw diet and had this major flare-up and the the mother panicked she's like you poisoned my dog no (laughs) no no and so you do want to throttle back and offer you know some topical soothing aids and that sort of thing with with essential oils or you know lavender lotions or whatever and she just could not wrap her head around that it had to come out, that it had to get out of the body before the dog could begin to heal. And that that could be throttled back a little bit, but that she had to go through this and she could not wrap her head around that, especially when it's somebody like me who's talking this new foreign concept without DVM behind my name and another veterinarian is saying to her, Oh no, you can't do that. Raw dog food's terrible. Or, Oh my God, you're going to kill your dog. And it's just such a hard conflict and a hard conversation to have. And so I understand how they, how the parent feels. Yeah. And it's a tough one. And I know that one of our, I think you and I were going to talk a little bit about the raw diets and, or what I call a fresh food diet, because um, 
Raw diet is actually the preferred. That's what a dog would eat out in the wild. It's going to kill something. It's going to kill a rabbit and it's going to eat it. Mm -hmm. um, raw, it's not going to go cook it and then eat it. It's going <laughs> to eat all there, of it. And I don't think people understand that part either. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? It's going to the fur, the right? feather, the bone, the everything. <laughs> right. Exactly. And uh, so when we, when somebody has been feeding a kibble food for a long period, maybe the dog's entire life and it's 10 years old and they want to switch, it's going to have to be done carefully and slowly right. because that gut microbiome is used to having that processed food in there. And then when you go give it something healthy, it goes, whoa, whoa, we got to get rid of this diarrhea, vomiting. And um, then the people are mad, right? Just like you experienced. But um, one of the concerns, concerns that a lot of people have in veterinarians. I've heard veterinarians say, well, you know, you got to watch the salmonella because Aunt Mary with her autoimmune condition is, yes. um, you know, she's going to be prone to that. And this makes absolutely no sense to me. And I'll tell you why. I guarantee you that when you pull that chicken out of the package from the grocery store and you handle it with your bare hands to put it in the pan or the broiler or whatever, you're touching it. You do the same thing when you're making raw food for your animals. You're using raw food. So it, it, as long as you wash your hands, you clean up your utensils, there shouldn't be any issue with that. And yeah. then I get the veterinarians that say, well, you know, some of these animals are going to get salmonella poisoning. You know what? They're going to go out. My cats, my barn cats go out and they catch little rodents and probably full of salmonella because the gut carries salmonella. We have salmonella in our bodies. It's mm -hmm. just that there's a good, a balance between the good bacteria and the bad bacteria. Right. And uh, so it makes no sense, especially when an animal's stomach, like a dog's pH of their stomach is lower than ours, meaning it's more acidic. It kills more pathogens. And that's why dogs can go out and eat roadkill and survive where we may not be so lucky, you know? Exactly. So, and I think a lot of people but I, didn't worry about the dog. So the dog just ate a bowl of uncooked meat and then turns around and licks the kid or licks something that the kid's going to have access to and transfer that. And I'm like, no, <laughs> if we keep everything clean, you know, and, and if the dog, if they're anything like mine, they've licked the bowl, <laughs> you could probably reuse it. I don't, but you probably could. And that they're, the bacteria in their mouth is going to break that down or start that process as well and make sure that, you know, five minutes later, it's not going to transfer to the human. Well, right. I just thought, I thought of, well, here's, here's another analogy and this is gross. But dogs lick their behinds a lot. What's to say it doesn't lick their behind that has bacteria around it and then go lick your, ch your child. Exactly. You can't. That's why we have immune systems, you know? Exactly. Yep. <laughs> so, and yeah. so, no, I wouldn't. About, go ahead. What about this dog that's, let's, you, I'm, I'm on a, this topic of crisis, these animals that are really unhealthy when they step in, because that's what I get a lot of. I, I find it, I find it interesting that it's very difficult for people to shift proactively. They're almost in this mode of, well, I've never had a problem before, or it doesn't look broken today. I'm not going to, not going to begin this proactive process into these natural things. And then by the time many of them reach out to me, and I'm sure to you in some cases as well, they're in a real crisis. I mean, they're like, and sometimes we get way too, way too late in the process. And so how do we balance that? We can't throw the book at them, right? Because the dog's already in crisis and we don't want to make it too, we don't want to create a real healing crisis. And there's a word I keep coming back to, I know it's a longer word than Herx, but you'll know what that word is. But how do we, how do we get proactive? That's wrong. How do we get assertive enough without creating that healing crisis when they are in a state of desperation. And I think too many people want to sort of limp into it rather than getting really assertive about all the things that need to happen. Am I making sense? I'm not sure I'm clear today. 
Um, I think I understand what you're saying, Dana. Um, people are a little bit afraid to upset the apple cart. So going back to the dog that looks like there's no problem, how many dogs have you seen? Let me ask, let me just rephrase that. I'll tell you, I've seen a lot of dogs that come into practice, they look healthy. And then maybe you run some blood work, they look healthy. A month later, they're coming back with this huge mass in their abdomen. Mm -hmm. Well, and maybe the blood work, you run the blood work again, it still looks great. I, I can tell you, it just shocks me how many animals come in to practice that are near death's door and you run blood work and they look fine. Mm. All that tells me is that it's not infiltrating a particular organ system at that point. So the other flip, the other um, side of that is I've had a little dog that came in. We were suspicious of Cushing's disease, ran blood work, and uh, the liver enzymes were off scale. Cortisol levels were fine. Um, the liver enzymes were so high, I was thinking this dog is not going to survive more than a couple of weeks. Dog lived three more years with supplements and so on. We never got the liver enzymes back in a normal range. But that dog was vibrant, healthy, eating, playing, and it died of old age. So, you know, it's one of those things you really never know. Yeah. I don't think I'm completely answering your question. So um, kind of prompt me on what you well, are, you know, this healing let's crisis. Say, let's, yeah. So let's say I have a dog, uh, somebody has called me and we're going to loop you into the conversation. And that dog okay. has like, serious digestive issues as an example which is a common thing for me to see they're they're unhealthy the dog is unhealthy and i start talking to them about we need to clean up the diet we need a transition process to do that and we probably need to look at some essential oils and some supplementation <clears throat> when we do, we can we can work through that gently but if the dog is like in crisis mode he's been again he's really unhealthy how aggressive do we need to be and is that with the oils and then the diet gentles its way forward or you know would you because i think people go okay i'm gonna put a drop on the dog and what we really need is like multiple drops of frankincense right so let I, I don't know why my brain is not clear today because I even have notes in front of me, but <laughs> <laughs> let's, let me back this up. Let me take a cancer patient. We want to start working on cancer. So we're going to change the diet. We're going to add supplements. We're going to add essential oils, all the things you can probably prescribe like herbs from standard process and all that jazz. Right. But we've mm -hmm. given them an, a, an essential oil protocol. It's not a drop right? Sometimes it's like mini drops, right? Because I, I think people get locked into their brain that we have to do, that we're going to kill the dog with the oils, or we're going to kill the dog with too much vitamin, or we're, you know, that there's going to be this overdose of something. And can you just share with us how that works when we're in, in sort of this life-saving recovery effort? I'm not sure I'm clear. I'm sure. Angry. Well, I, I think I, I understand what you're trying to say, Dana. And again, there's no right or wrong here. Um, I do believe that people, uh, especially cancer patients, are uh, inclined to have cancer patients. They're in denial somewhat. And I've had people wait too long to start a protocol. And then it's to the point of no return. So I try to get them on board as soon as possible with a holistic protocol. And then I leave it up to the animal. Um, obviously, if it's a small dog, they might need one or two drops. If it's a toy breed dog, it might need just a few drops. If it's a large breed or giant breed dog, then we're gonna need maybe 15 to 20 drops. It okay. just all depends on how severe the situation is and how the animal tolerates it. Just okay. like with um, people and horses, dogs can get 
what we call a detoxification rash, which um, when you apply an essential oil, or even if you're doing acupuncture, sometimes you'll find that the dogs develop a rash or the horse will develop a rash or little welts on its back. But my favorite technique, and I know that you're very familiar with this and you probably teach this to a lot of your clients, is the raindrop technique. And this is applying, for those of you who don't know what raindrop is, is where you apply a sequence of specific oils to the dog's spine, starting at the tail, and then you feather stroke them up to the base of the neck. And these oil, the, the whole premise for doing it over the spine is that a lot of toxins, viruses, bacteria, and funguses live in the spinal fluid that surrounds the spinal cord. And by putting the oils on the spine, you're getting it very close to the area that, where it needs to get and get those organisms killed or out of there. So that's my favorite thing to start with because raindrop is not just one oil. It is nine oils. And then you can mix or match for that particular condition. Mm -hmm. Any chronic illness, I think raindrop is very important for. Yeah. And that works very powerfully because the first three oils tend to be the cleaners. They clean up the damage or the junk that's in there. And then the other oils come in and they restore, or they replenish. So when we've got a healthier animal all together. Um, so that's one, one place I start. And you can get pretty aggressive with supplements too, but if an animal that isn't eating well, then I tend to go, let's, let's use something topically like your essential oils for digestive issues. So especially like Young Living has one called Digize. Absolutely love that one. They also have one called um, Tummy Gize for kids, which can be used on or smaller dogs. Mm -hmm. And then they also have Parafree or Paragize um, for, you know, whatever, digestive para, and I would add the um, letters S-I-T-E-S -E after that, <laughs> you know, and because um, a lot of, a lot of parasites cause digestive issues. So um, exactly. if we use these three oils, I mean, it, and you, it doesn't matter which one you use, it just, you know, um, I, sometimes it sounds a little crazy, so bear with me, but I will muscle test to find out which oil that animal needs. Yes. And that way. And how many yeah. drops and, and that sort of thing. Right. So you you kind of, mm -hmm. you hit on what I think I've been trying to say is that when we think about essential oils, we tend to go, we need one or we need a diluted version, but sometimes that's just not true. And like, if I give my smallest dachshund, he's 18 years old now, uh, a raindrop, he averages about 45 drops of oil. If I do all nine, and three along the back, two on the legs and the feet of each of those nine oils, that's five drops of each. That's a whole bunch of oil, <laughs> right? And that he, is. <laughs> he's like, it's fantastic, you know. So, and I don't always do that, but when he was when he was struggling, I'm I'm like, oh my God, that was like 45 drops of oil. <laughs> I don't do it that way every because we do them monthly, but I didn't kill my dog with essential oils, is kind of the thing. And you also have the ability. Right. You also have the ability to coach people on doing like an essential oil enema, for example, if we had a cancer patient, and you know, do some things like that. And so that's sort of this aggressiveness that I'm talking about. That it's not we plop one drop on their head and hope for the best. That we really do right. take some assertive um protocols to try and really help that body start to heal and repair itself yeah that's right and, and i figure if you've got a life-threatening situation and you know that you don't have um conventional the, the the conventional treatments aren't going to work what have you got to lose that's what the my mantra yes. is what do we have to lose exactly mm -hmm. and that we're not going to harm that animal, right? We're, I mean, we don't want to do this type right. of assertiveness often or all day, every day, but in, in a crisis situation, we do what you got to do. You, you do what you're sort right. of feeling intuitively led to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> Let's see where I am in my notes. So we kind of hit on the detox and the healing crisis already a little bit. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about these never had a problem before, because I run into this quite a lot. Um, flea and tick is a common issue. And I'll say to people things like, 
oh, you really, you know, let's, let's not use Brevecto or let's not use these Soresto collars or let's not use whatever. And their response to me is, I've never had a problem before. Or we'll talk about vaccines. And I'm like, your dog probably doesn't need another parvo distemper vaccine. Why don't you, why don't you titer them? Or your dog probably doesn't need a Bordetella unless they're going and are required by um, their doggy daycare, you know. But if you do, there's some detox things that we can work on at vaccination time or after. And they're like, oh, well, well we've never had a problem before. So help us, help us understand why the body might tolerate things until it can't. Okay, so first of all, Dana, I would say we have to look at the cumulative effects. That means maybe you can get by with one or two months or even a year of chemicals on your dog or inside your dog, like with the um, Simperica tablets or whatever. I, I'm getting way ahead of myself. So let's say whether you put a topical or a chem or a um, internal type of flea tick heartworm preventative on your dog. No matter what the company says, it gets into the systemic organ systems. It does, it happens no other way. It has to be excreted somehow. Mm -hmm. But I believe a small amount still stays in the matrix. And the matrix is kind of a qu uh, quantum physics type of thing, but basically it's tissue under the skin. So that's what I consider the matrix. Now, five, six, seven years of year round chemicals in your dog, which many veterinarians are telling their clients, you need year round heartworm prevention. Even if you live in the desert, you need year round <laughs> heartworm prevention. Mm -hmm. It's so absurd, it's so insane. I'm sorry, I get really passionate about this. But then we're seeing the dogs that come in with liver failure, or they've got a nodule on their liver. They have a cancer. They have cancer anywhere in their body. They have a blood disorder. Um, what's to say that it's not caused by vaccines and, and all the other chemicals and chemicals in the dry kibble food that you're feeding? Um, it, it, just, it just goes on and on. Same way with humans. People go, well, I've never had a problem with that before. Um, I didn't know. I thought I was a pretty healthy person when I was diagnosed with cancer. And I found that I wasn't. I was very sick because cancer is the end result of all your organs kind of like saying, eh, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I'm not saying never use the chemicals because there are some instances where if you have a dog that comes in, it's got 50 or 60 fleas crawling all over it. It has oozing weeping sores from a flea bite allergy. We're probably gonna wanna break the life cycle of that flea with at least one dose of a topical. And I really, um, this is my personal opinion, uh, those Serestro call or Serestro collars and even Brevecto that stays in the system at a time, it doesn't make sense. Why would we want those harsh chemicals in our pets for that length of time? I was just turned uh, or just aware of the Serestro uh, side effects here recently. Even mainstream media came out with the dangers of Sorestro was on CBS. Mm -hmm. I think it was CBS News and I think Yahoo had it on their homepage. And I looked at it and, and then of course the companies are saying, well, um, we've got to keep offering this and we're not going to take it off the market because then the, four, uh, the counterfeit products will come and those are going to be worse than the brand name. Um, sorry, but if, if, if we have counterfeit, pro uh, counterfeit products are not going to be sold through veterinarians anyway. Um, only FDA approved things are. So I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Kind of, you have to well, bring the leash, put it around my neck. <laughs> you and I are both. <laughs> I don't know if it's, if it's Good Friday or what. We're not supposed to be working today or what, but my brain is not. <laughs> my brain is having trouble forming sentences too. Um, but let's talk about the Soresto thing. I think a lot of people, whether it's the Soresto collar or even some of the, the, well, let's start with the Soresto. I think when they 
people believe when they put that collar on, there is nothing being absorbed into their dog's body, that it is the collar repelling the insect. And that's simply not true. That collar has a chemical in it that will be absorbed into the dog's bloodstream. Is that true? That is true, Dana. And whether it, it, first of all, it has to be absorbed through the dermal tissues, the three mm -hmm. top layers of the skin, and then it gets into the bloodstream through the tiny capillaries and into the big veins and vessels. If it wasn't absorbed, then we wouldn't have these um, dogs developing seizures from the collar, or if they have a pre-existing seizure disorder, it says you're not supposed to use it. What does that tell you? It tells you that these things are toxic, especially because they, they kill the insect by causing tremors and seizures and neurological problems with the bugs. And it happens no differently in your dogs, except not to the extent where, well, now I've heard some dogs that have died from these things. So I can't say that it's not gonna kill the dog, but. Right. Yeah, and so yeah. I want people to take take away from this that the collar is not a repellent and neither are the flea and tick topicals or orals. The insect must bite your dog and absorb enough or intake enough of these neurotoxins, these chemicals that will then cause that insect to die. And that toxin is coursing through the dog's bloodstream around the clock waiting to be bitten and so right. we have to look at what that must do to the organs and the systems and the blood of the body especially when you as you said look at the compounding effects of whatever other chemicals we're exposing that body to and a Soresto right. collar for example has eight months worth of it now, hopefully your dog's not absorbing eight months worth at any given time, but that's a heavy load to be in that collar. And I would say each dog would have a different absorption rate and could potentially absorb too much if there's already something happening in the liver or underlying systems of the body that says, I've been doing fine, and, but I've been struggling. I haven't told y'all about it. Nobody knew I was struggling, but now I just can't bear this burden. It was too much. Is that a realistic right. way yeah. of explaining it to people? Absolutely, Dana. I think you hit the nail on the head there. Um, and I think that the attraction with the Soresto collars is that they don't have to remember, the client doesn't have to remember to put a topical on or they don't want to pick, I mean, before we had all these products, you know how we took care of flea and, fleas and ticks? Manually extract, extracting them, you know, taking a flea oh, comb mm -hmm. and maybe a little flea powder, you know, and, and, and getting, getting them off. And that was the way that we controlled that. Now we have all these chemicals. And I, here, I'm just going to put this for uh, food for thought out there. We have the most modern, modern medicine out there in veterinary medicine and human medicine, yet we are all sick and our animals are sick, sicker than, I mean, you look at these farm dogs that eat roadkill and they eat horse poop or cow manure, whatever they eat, and they go out and they rummage in the dirt and they walk across manure and they live to be 18 or 19 years old. Then we've got the little house dog that's pampered and has all these products and all these vaccines, even though they're not exposed to probably the majority of the things that they're vaccinating against, and they die at 12. Yeah. You know, I mean, it just, you got to think about that. And uh, it, it makes total sense to me. Um, and my mission as part of the natural animal health movement that I've created is to bring about this awareness. Yeah. So if somebody's trying to deal with fleas and ticks, I think most people, I, I was, when I first started saying I'm not going to use flea and tick products anymore, it, it's funny because I never thought... I had an option, but I also never stopped and thought, do I even have a flea and tick problem in my yard, right? <laughs> I'd never seen them, but it's just automatic. You go to the vet's office and you get your heartworm medicine, you get your flea and tick medicine, you get your shots and you walk out and it's just what you did. And so when I started saying, oh, I'm 
because none of us want fleas, right? We, none of us want our dogs to be itchy, scratchy, but God forbid of them be in the house. We would all hate that. And so there's this real reluctance of trying something new. So I spritzed oils and you can share your favorite oils, but I, I would use like combinations of lemongrass, geranium, citronella. Now there's kunzia that I would probably use. Um, maybe a little lavender built in there and make a spritz out of it. And so I would spritz my dogs every day because I lived in the country. We never had a problem. And then I'm like, do I even really need the oils? And so I was getting real brave at this time, right? Do I even need the oils? And I realized that being on such a healthy diet, my dogs weren't attracting them in the first place unless we went for a big hike out in the woods and brushed up against some of the shrubs or trees that the ticks might have been in. And then we would spritz when we did out there. But in my yard, we did like cedarwood oil and diatomaceous earth, and we haven't had problems since. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful thing to do. And people don't think about that because I, I tell you, Dana, um, without offending any of your listeners here, I do find that, and I've been there myself, so guilty as charged, but people want to do the easy thing. And yeah. it's, it takes time to research. It takes time to treat your yard with diatomaceous earth and essential oils. Um, when they can just slap on a collar or, or a topical or shove a pill down their throat. But we have to think about the long-term effects of these drugs. And because a lot of these products are brand new, we don't know the full um, damage, the whole scale of damage that can be potentially out there yet. And even Brevecto now has warnings that you do not do Brevecto and um, HeartGuard together because you can have a seizure disorder develop out of nowhere. So yeah. what does that tell you? Well, and, and I think uh, it's important. People, oh. No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's okay. No, I was just saying if people would take a more proactive approach, if you really love your dog, like you say you do, then you will take the time to research and not stay on the mainstream news sites. Um, do not go to the company's product page because they'll make their product sound like it's liquid gold. Um, don't exactly. go there, but try to get these. Like, for example, if you're researching food, a wonderful website is the truth about the uh, truthaboutpetfood.com. Mm -hmm. And you'll, you'll be shocked if you see some of the information that these yeah. three veterinarians who are researchers have put on that page. Yeah, because we're not going to see studies that prove they're harmful. The companies aren't right. going to pay for that. And you and I, people oh, like no. that, we can't afford to pay for it, right? But we have right. to, I think we have to be realistic when you start seeing complaint filed after complaint filed and story after story of somebody saying, this happened to me, you know, my dog died within minutes or days of these products and that when we see those disclaimers on the commercials don't use on unwell pets may cause seizures or whatever and it's in little tiny fine print down on the bottom of your tv screen that didn't happen with one or two right that happened because there's a big enough outcry that they feel like they have to disclose that but they really didn't want you to read it <laughs> you know what i mean right well in a lot of these companies by the time that all of these side effects and these deaths adverse what we call adverse drug reactions happen that come and and maybe the company has to pull their product at that point they've made millions maybe billions of dollars already right so the company's like oh well, yeah we don't care because um, we're making all kinds of money here. Mm -hmm. And if you, if, if you, your listeners for one minute think that these companies have your pet's best interest at mind, no, no, do not think that because they are out, they are making a product for a profit, not for your animal's health. Right. And the same way goes for vaccines. People don't realize that there are up to 22 various ingredients in vaccines, including mercury derivatives, formaldehyde, foreign animal proteins, because they have to grow the cell culture on some animal protein, antibiotics, antifungals, other chemicals for preservatives, synthetics, 
you name it. And these are the things that the pets are reacting to. So I guess um, I'm getting a little passionate I was gonna say, again. We, we got on a soapbox here for a little while. <laughs> right? But I think it's important to be that way because if we just did out these things and um, I wish my colleagues would flipping wake up and research the stuff that they're giving. But you know what happens is these drug companies, Dana, come around, hey, um, we're going to do a lunch and learn today. Which uh, do you want? Do you want um, bagels? Do you want um, subs? Do you want pizza? And they come and they wine and dine you and present this wonderful picture about their product. Guilty's yeah. charged, been there, done that. Oh, I'm going to support that company. Man, they treated us really well. Yeah. Without doing the research on what the heck is in these products. And I'm guilty too. I was very guilty as a pet owner, pet lover, foster home of doing what, what everybody else told me I was supposed to do and not taking a step back and going, is this right? Is this really right? Can this be? You know, and it wasn't even with down to the foods we were feeding and their oh, frequency right. of vaccines and all that comes with that. And so I feel like sometimes when, when I make a post on Facebook or do a video that it's, it's, it can be perceived as me on a soapbox or me being preachy and me trying to sell a product. Right. And really mm -hmm it couldn't be further from the reality of all I really want is for us to stop harming our dogs. Correct. I want yes. them to live long, healthy, thriving lives and for us to know better and stop harming them. And in my very cynical brain, um, I really think that there is a correlation between Big pharma, whether it's veterinary pharma or human pharma, mm -hmm. and um, health, because these are not healthy products. And the sicker we can keep us and our animals, then the more money big pharma and the hospitals and the doctors make. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to shift us to the final question that I had on my list, and it's a completely different topic, <laughs> completely <laughs> off the soapbox. And it's about hormones in our animals. And I, I feel like I see this quite often as a trainer, that we have these really over-adrenalized dogs and that their adrenals are struggling, for lack of a better word. And I would like for maybe you to help us understand um, what that is and what stress and anxiety and things of that nature can do to the adrenal system and or their hormones in our body. Now, with spay, neuter animals, we don't often think about them having hormones or the need to support hormones, but can you pull all that together for us and help us understand a little? Sure, Dana. Um, there are several factors. Um, again, if we're feeding processed foods, oftentimes there are what we call endocrine disruptors in the food. Even chlorinated water can disrupt thyroid function. And a lot of people don't understand this. The stress, now because of all the events in the last year and a half have been going on, people are under stress. Our animals mirror us, okay? So we are in chronic stress mode, the animals pick up on that. And it's energy entanglement, and that's a whole different subject. But um, so these animals that are anxious, a little irritable, a little um, fearful, then the stress hormone called cortisol is released in big levels. And if we continue to be stressed or animals continue to be stressed all the time, Cushing's disease is almost an epidemic in dogs anymore, I think. And mm -hmm. what, what's going to happen with these dogs is when they're constantly having all this cortisol being released, cortisol is natural. It's the uh, cortisone is the synthetic of cortisol. We need cortisol or cortisone in our body to some extent, but when it is 
not shut down by the normal pathways that say, turn off, please, turn off, please, we've got enough cortisol, then we start to see disease of all of the hormonal um, glands in the body go crazy. And you mentioned spaying, spayed and neutered um, animals. Um, there are some essential oils that I, you know, even for horses, I know we're talking about dogs here, but just to give you an example for horses, I use Progestins Plus. It's a young living product when the mares come into heat because they can get really ornery. They can get very irritable and Progestins Plus just helps the natural hormones balance itself out, balance themselves out. And then there are things like Endoflex. This is another young living essential oil blend, Myrtle spearmint. These can be very supportive of the hormones. And I oftentimes put Endoflex over the uh, small of the back on a dog for the adrenal support, as well as on the neck for the thyroid support. Um, the endocrine system is very, very complicated. So I don't want to get too detailed sure. here, but just, just remember that the thyroid is the master gland and it controls all of the other hormonal glands in the body, including um, the pancreas, the adrenals, the sex organs, um, ovaries and testes, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Can a dog take Cordostop? I don't see why not. Okay. I don't think I've used it in a dog, but um, I know in women, they say that you should only use it for two weeks and then stop for two weeks, go right. on at two weeks, stop for two weeks. So I would think that if we pulled the capsule apart and gave just a pinch of that in their food daily, that might help them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good product. Thank you. So my question, and I think this might be my last question for today, is if it, so I, I, pit bulls are a classic example of what I call an over adrenalized dog. I've even heard some other trainers call them adrenaline junkies, right? That they just... <laughs> Right. They, they thrive off of that high aroused energy and the intensity that comes with that. Is, is that a function of the adrenals first or can we harm the adrenals by staying in that state? I, I think the answer might be it can go both ways but I want to yeah. understand that a little bit. I, I think you're, I'm not really sure what, if the horse came before the cart with that or not, Dana, but um, definitely stress, chronic stress will keep those adrenals stressed. And then you go into adrenal failure, which is the opposite of, of everything. And then you have a dog that's really lethargic, maybe develop some other autoimmune conditions and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it, that breed is just a tough, they're strong and they're tough and they're full of energy. Mm -hmm. And I would say that shepherds too are in that category. Of, Alan was. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Sometimes right. The Aussies. Yeah. <laughs> but again, I think that these animals, um, a lot of times I see these overly energetic animals and maybe there's a breed predisposition to it too. But um, if they're eating a lot of carbs, which any food, any dry kibble, even if it's grain free, has 60 to 70% starch in it because starch is what holds that kibble together. Mm -hmm. And then what happens, what happens when um, that starch is metabolized in the dog's body, it turns into sugar. And then they're on a chronic sugar high. Mm -hmm. And then we have all these inflammatory conditions because of that. Right. So I want to go back to one more thing because in the, in the um, beginning, I talked about fresh food diets. For those clients who are not, um, are squeamish about fixing a raw, I've, I've had several, they're kind of squeamish about fixing a raw food diet. I'll say, well, do the next best thing and lightly cook the food. Sure. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, they still, they're still going to get protein. They're going to get some nutrients, but they're probably going to have to be supplemented with a good quality. And I know you use the Borehand um, supplements, Bullhard. right? Bullhard. I'm sorry. That's okay. Where'd they get that word? <laughs> um, and, you know, be, because we don't want to just grab some supplement off the pet foods or like go to your big box uh, pet food stores and buy a supplement that we don't know what's in it. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, and there's nothing wrong with fresh food. I'd rather have the fresh food in versus any kind of dry kibble any day of the week. Okay. So the, the term gently cooked, I think is important for us to clarify for people. And 
to me, that means like low and slow crock pot cooking or a gentle little saute to the point of not really overdoing the cook of the meat. Um, and we're not trying to create well done meat if we're sauteing it in the pan or, you know, stirring it that way. But a gentle cook can still be like a low and slow crock pot meal. Would you agree with that? Right, because you're keeping all the juices in the crock pot and you're going to feed the juice along with the meat. The last thing I want to see people do is boil of the meat, like they'll boil chicken. And then when they drain it, then everything's lost. So right. um, I'm, I'm, not in, I'm not in favor of that. But uh, like you said, lightly cooking means to me that it would be similar to, well, I don't want blood oozing out of it per se, but I want it uh, light, you know, just I want to see red in the meat, but I don't want to see blood oozing out if, if a person is adverse to a raw diet. Okay. Right. Agreed. Um, Agreed. Yeah. And even my cats, sometimes my, I've got four house cats and I cook their food or give them a raw food. And sometimes they want the raw, sometimes they want it just lightly cooked. And then by that, I mean, if I put some ground turkey in the pan, it's just going to get to the point where it looks like it's cooked and then they love it. Yes. We do that on many transitions so to dogs. I've had many a client go, oh, I don't think I can feed raw food to my dog. And I'm like, okay, because we <laughs> use a lot of turkey and hamburger. I'm like, okay, then just mm -hmm. lightly saute it and kind of leave it pink. And then within a few days, they're like, okay, raw is just so much easier. <laughs> then sometimes <laughs> right? the dog needs, sometimes the dog needs um, to sort of feel it transition, right? To go from that, mm -hmm. I don't know what this raw meat in my bowl is to, Oh, that's pretty tasty. You know, and they need that transition of, of making it a, a little bit cooked first. So there are a lot of options and I am not, I, I, I will say I'm pretty anti kibble, but I'll help my clients who need to stay on kibble, improve the quality through vitamins and minerals and supplementation and fresh veggies when we need to add that. Um, since we've been on this topic of um, harming our dogs, I, we've been seeing a lot of reports recently, and I just saw a study where vegetables, right? We say add vegetables to our dog's diet, and now we're seeing that they're coming with Roundup in them. I'm like, oh goodness, we're not making this better. So we really need to focus on organic quality when we can. Um, you know, we don't want to add more glyphosate to our dog's diet. And um, wow. So this month, we're going to be talking about petrochemical uh, detox in our group. So jump in on the conversation when your schedule permits, and I'll be sharing more with clients about that in our Facebook group. So, all right. Great. Any other thing you want to add? Let me just check my notes here, Dean. I had a whole page of them here. Uh, I don't want to keep you too long. Oh, uh, You asked me about how long it takes to detox. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. How and that's that all depends on the animal. Yep. Um there there are energetic blockages sometimes like in and I've experienced this myself where um I have to have my chiropractor rebalance my chakras and so for those of you who don't know that we'll talk about chakras at some point and how to take care of those but if an organ is stuck say like your liver maybe the ducts are for whatever reason things are not flowing through um, easily, and this comes under a lot of Chinese medicine and, and acupuncture, where the qi energy, the meridians, maybe the energy isn't flowing through um, like it should, then it, the detox is going to take a lot longer. And uh, so each animal, each person is individual, and I can't ever tell somebody how long it's going to take for them to, det to mm -hmm. detox. It all is a process that takes time. And I think that's all I have then. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time again today and look forward to having you come back and seeing you in the group. Thank you, Dana. Have a great weekend and thanks for everybody who listened today. Yeah. And if you need help from Dr. Fox, she does um, telemedicine consults. She mentioned that in the intro, but just to recap here, her website is barbfoxdvm.com right? Thanks, Dana. Perfect. Yep. You bet. Got it.
Thank you. Hi, these podcasts are for educational purposes only. We are not here to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any specific disease or illness. You are encouraged to do your own research and consult with your veterinarian or holistic practitioner regarding your pet's individual care. Hi, I'm Dana Brigman of the Canine Coach Carolinas. You can find me on the internet at caninecoach.dog. That's letter K, number nine, coach.dog. You can also find me on Facebook at the Canine Coach Carolinas or in our group that is designed to teach dog mamas just like you more about nutrition, essential oils, homeopathy, and other areas of natural wellness. We want you to learn all that you can to keep your dog happy, healthy, and thriving. I hope to see you in our group soon.